give me a kiss to build a dream on. After 20 years, I finally understand why some people prefer Fallout 1 over Fallout 2. Personally, I still prefer the sequel, but I think I get it now. I always thought of Fallout 2 as the sequel that improved on the original in every way. Its world is bigger, its writing is better, and you have far more freedom to create your own stories instead of following the main path. Fallout 2 has a couple of huge story moments that still resonate throughout the Fallout franchise today, and it improves the story of the first game with a bit of tactical retconning. However, the conclusion of Fallout 2's story is nowhere near as satisfying when compared to the first game, and the major nemesis doesn't come close to the majesty of Fallout 1's The Master. While Fallout 2 offers plenty of freedom for most of the adventure, its ending is strangely restrictive. So if you prefer Fallout 1 over 2, then yes, I get it. I understand where you're coming from now. I just don't agree. This video is the second in an ongoing series on isometric CRPGs. The first video is on Fallout 1, and I recommend you watch that one before this. There should be a link on screen now. I've made a separate video discussing what I hope to achieve with this isometric CRPG series, but the gist of it is that I intend to play all the major isometric CRPGs in order of release, starting with Fallout 1 and moving forward to the present day. I'll talk a bit about the development history of each game and then delve into the experience I had playing them. The focus will be on how the games feel to play now and not an attempt to appreciate them for what they were. With the exception of the early Fallout games, I either never played the games when they were new or only dabbled with them a bit. I'm not getting a bit of fake nostalgia or sense of appreciation just based on a game's reputation. Obviously all of these videos will be heavy on spoilers. As with my first video on Fallout 1, I want to highlight the excellent Eurogamer interview with Tim Kaine, Leonard Boyarski and Francis Urquhart. I highly recommend watching it for a frank discussion about the industry in the mid to late 90s and how the first two Fallout games were made. Chris Bratt, who conducted the interview, recently left Eurogamer to set up his own business called People Make Games. He has a Patreon page which I encourage you to check out. With that out of the way, let's get stuck into Fallout 2. Interplay Productions greenlit Fallout 2 a few months before the release of Fallout 1. Tim Kaine and his team developed Fallout 1 as an unofficial group within Interplay Productions, but for the sequel, Interplay wanted them to form an official subdivision. After failing to come up with a name after months of nagging, Francis Urquhart reluctantly went with Black Isle Studios, which was the name he always wanted to use if he formed a studio of his own, Black Isle being a series of islands off Scotland that Urquhart could trace his family history back to. Black Isle Studios consisted of many of the same people who made Fallout 1, however the transition wasn't a smooth one. Tim Kaine left during development to form Troika Games, although he did chip in with some thoughts on early story outlines. Francis Urquhart then took control of development. To further complicate things, Interplay entered bankruptcy during development, but raised funds by going public and then changed its name to Interplay Entertainment. The company is still kicking around, just about. Fallout 2 was released a year after Fallout 1, meaning that development time was less than 18 months in total. To put that in perspective, it's taken me more than 5 months to get around to releasing this video after the first one. That Black Isle Studios could get such an incredible product out in that time is a minor miracle. However, the prompt release did have its drawbacks. Employees reportedly had to work 100 hour weeks and the end product was full of bugs. Some were patched out, but many weren't. I like to think that Bethesda continues to release buggy Fallout games as a tribute to the team that made Fallout 2. Fallout 1 was made with a small team all working together for about 3 years. Much of this time was spent creating the core of the game such as the engine, rule set and special system. With so much of the core game already in place, Black Isle Studios could split its people into team and have them all work on separate areas. One team worked on Urino, another worked on Vault City, another on the Den, etc. This development method led to large towns that you could spend hours in completing side quests and settling disputes. It's probably the reason places like New Reno are so memorable and it might be why the main story isn't so impactful this time around. More on that later. The lack of development time means that most of the fundamental problems in Fallout 1 are still present in Fallout 2, mainly the poor combat system, tedious AI and lack of feedback to help players understand the consequences of their actions. Fallout 2's combat is pretty simple compared to CRPGs based on the D&D ruleset. That's not usually something I'd mark down as a negative. I've played some Baldur's Gate and the complexity of that ruleset for someone not used to D&D is fairly daunting. However, Fallout's combat feels stale. It's not a difficulty thing either. I had fights that were too easy, a few that were too hard, and plenty that were pitched about right difficulty-wise. None of them were fun. Combat is turn-based and you have a set number of action points to use for each turn. The amount of action points consumed to use a weapon varies based on the weapon, with larger ones typically costing more action points and whether or not you use your VATS. VATS usually costs one more action point per shot. Your exact number of action points depends on your character build and can be increased with perks as you play. 
Likewise, whether any given hit is successful and if so, how much damage it does depends on your build. With skill points in categories like small guns, large guns, energy weapons and melee being crucial where appropriate. For defense, your total hit points are determined largely by your endurance stat. Armor impacts your armor class, which confusingly works in the opposite way to CRPGs that are based on D&D. From my admittedly limited knowledge of games like Baldur's Gate, you usually want your armor class to be as low as possible. Likewise, the attacker would want a number known as Thaco, which stands for to hit armor class zero, to be as low as possible. The armor class is subtracted from the Thaco to determine what dice roll the attacker needs to land an attack. To give a very quick example, if the attacker has a Thaco of 15 and you have an armor class of 10, then the attacker needs to roll at least a 5. If you have an armor class of 4, then the attacker needs to roll at least an 11 on a 20 sided die, so you want your armor class to be low. In Fallout 2, the higher the armor class, the better. To be clear, the armor class determines whether or not an attack will land, not the amount of damage the attack will do if it does land. Armor has separate stats that reduce damage. Instead of Thaco, Fallout 2 looks to the attacker's skill at using a particular weapon type, with once again higher being better. The attacker's skill is then reduced to account for distance from the enemy and the particular body part you're going for. It's typically easier to hit someone's torso than their eyes, as you might expect. I don't know if there's any official term for this number, so I'm just going to refer to it as the attack class. Armor class is subtracted from attack class and then compared to a random number between 1 and 100. If the random number is bigger than the attack will hit. Let's work through a basic example. Let's say you have weapon skill in small guns of 80 and a modifier of 65% for range. Your enemy has an armor class of 10. The math should look a bit like this. If the random number is 42 or more then you can get a hit in and the game moves into the next stage of the calculation to determine the amount of damage. The frustrating part is that you can't know your enemy's armor class so when it says you have a 95% chance of hitting that's not actually accounting for any armor they might have. This can lead to frustrating situations where players wonder why they were only hitting about 65% of shots when it should be 95%. Despite the differences, this system is a lot more like D&D than it initially looks. Fallout 2 uses numbers out of 100 because it isn't limited by a 20 sided die and its equivalent to Thaco and armor class need to be high instead of low. However, the calculation looks similar and more importantly the attack always has a chance to miss. That's why you never see a hit percentage higher than 95% regardless of your skill with the weapon and how close you are. This 5% chance to miss is the same as the 1 in 20 chance to miss that you have in D&D games. The random number generator is merely replacing the dice roll and working out of 100 instead of 20. Any unused action points you have at the end of a turn are added to your armor class for the next defense. This isn't going to make a huge difference to encounters. Even if you have 3 or 4 action points without any use for them, all you're doing is making it 4 percentage points easier to execute a successful dodge. It's better than nothing. It still costs you action points to open your inventory though, which is rather harsh. That's a high level overview of combat. There's obviously a lot more going on under the hood than that with your other attributes, skills and perks all playing a role behind the scenes to affect the outcome in combat. The basic idea is to get your characters close enough for successful hits while trying to maintain enough distance from enemies to avoid damage. While the basics are simple enough, I don't want to pretend that combat is easy because personally I've never beaten Fallout 2 on the hardest difficulty, although I must admit I haven't spent all that much time trying either. If you're struggling with combat in Baldur's Gate then there's always more you can learn. You can slow the fights down and pause constantly to micromanage your team. I'm not saying I enjoy doing this but you can do it if you want. That's not really the case in Fallout 2 due to the lack of information given to the player. I personally found it unsatisfying trying to perfect the combat and found too much of it came down to luck and guesswork. This lack of information is frustrating in the few instances that combat provides a challenge and you want to understand how to improve. It doesn't happen too often but when it does it's a frustrating roadblock. Strangely one of these challenging sections occurs right at the start of the game during the terrible prologue section known as the trials. I hate this section and not just because I don't enjoy it myself but because I suspect it probably makes people drop the game early on. It's hard enough to convince people to play old games as it is, putting such a terrible section at the start is practically asking for people to put the game down and shout at me for recommending it. The Trials is supposed to act as a tutorial, but it's a clumsy one because it teaches the wrong lessons. Before being allowed to leave the city of Arroyo, you have to beat the Trials. Once inside the temple you're faced with a bunch of ants and scorpions and all you have to fight them is a spear. That might not sound too bad, you're probably thinking that a spear is more than enough to beat some ants and scorpions. You should be right except there's a high chance your character will struggle a lot here because most people don't spec into melee weapons. You also might not be particularly strong and will take a ridiculous amount of damage per hit. It's a bit inaccurate to say this section is tough. You can get through it relatively easily if you run past all the enemies. This is annoying as all hell because you always enter a combat state when enemies are nearby so it takes ages. 
You're also missing out on early XP which most players are going to want. It's not in our nature to run past early enemies. If you do choose to fight them the best way is to attack once and then run away just far enough that they have to use up all their action points to catch up with you. You then attack once and run again. You basically end up running in circles. It looks and feels ridiculous. If I'm feeling generous I could say that this introduction is at least teaching you not to use weapons you aren't skilled in. Oh and you learn that you can use explosives to blow open doors. Those who create a character built for melee and explosives are laughing, the rest of us are bored and annoyed. My frustrations continued for a couple of hours after the trials. No matter how hard I tried I just couldn't get my hands on a pistol. I must have gotten a bit unlucky because I don't remember it ever being that bad in previous playthroughs. I even found a gun at one point but a bug stopped me from being able to pick it up. Once I did get my hands on a gun, combat became fairly easy with the exception of the odd critical hit or two. No matter who you're fighting, how many companions you have and how heavily you're armoured, you can never be too careful. I highly recommend saving often. There's another difficulty spike of sorts near the end when you're tasked with travelling to Navarro to steal the plans for a vertibird. There are a few other problems with this section relating to lack of story choice and forced character progression but I'll get into that later. For now I'll just mention that it can be a bit of a difficulty spike. I didn't have any power armour at this point and was hoping I wouldn't need it because I planned to avoid direct combat as much as possible. Navarro itself isn't too much of a problem, it's the getting there that's tough. When you're within a couple of squares of Navarro on the world grid you are regularly hit with random encounters from Enclave soldiers and they will tear you to shreds. I didn't even get the chance to run away let alone beat them in combat. The odd difficulty spike is not my biggest problem with combat. After all once you've solved whatever the problem is be it a lack of a decent weapon or power armour you can usually go back and win the fight easily later on. It serves more as a way to gate players from areas they shouldn't be able to reach yet as opposed to being a challenge you must figure out a way to overcome. No, I'm reserving the majority of my ire for how damn slow combat is. The problem is so bad that it affected my thought process for major story decisions. A few times I wanted to assassinate a character on a busy floor full of armed people that would quickly become enemies once I pulled my gun out. I was easily strong enough to fight through everyone and make it out alive. It was just a question of whether I could stand the boredom. Once you start combat, every enemy on the screen and many neutral characters insist on taking their turns one after another and it lasts forever. Even running from fights becomes tedious. One random encounter pit me against a large group of aliens that I was easily capable of defeating but didn't want to take the time to kill them all. A couple of the alien races move insultingly slowly. So slowly that I can only assume gravity on Earth is much higher than it is on their home planet. The worst encounter of all was in a side quest. I was asked to save a group of cows from some wolves. This was early in the game so I wasn't all that strong but I knew I could take down a group of wolves and I could if I had the patience. After a couple of rounds of watching every single wolf and cow slowly take their turn I decided to bail. Just moving to the edge of the screen to escape combat took forever so I ended up reloading an old save. This is with the combat speed on fast by the way. It doesn't feel all that fast but compared to slow it's an improvement. Fallout 2 contains a few options for controlling companions during combat for all the good it will do. You can tell companions to be aggressive, defensive and the like as well as instructing them on what weapons to use and armour to wear. I'm still convinced they act randomly or maybe they're designed to do what will piss me off the most. For example you can tell Marcus to be defensive and not recommend a particular weapon for him to use. But that won't stop him wasting precious minigun ammo mowing down Mantis when you're trying to run away from the encounter. He also has a habit of just standing around doing nothing during combat or using his fists even when he still has ammo for the gun. Obviously combat changed a lot in Fallout 3, the next mainline entry that we count. The change in perspectives makes any detailed comparison a little pointless but one thing I do want to emphasise is how much more I enjoy VATS and power arm in the original two games. It's not so much that Fallout 1 and 2 do it particularly well, more that the two systems never clicked with me in the first person games. When combat is turn based like it is here, choosing the VATS option barely takes any extra time when you're doing the exact same thing you always do in combat, just also choosing to take aim at a specific body part. In Fallout 3 onwards combat is in real time and obviously first person. So using VATS requires you to stop what you're doing and interact with the combat in a completely different way. It's not that the earlier games have better combat, it's just that VATS is far more suited to turn based gameplay. Fallout 4 slows down time instead of freezing it, however you're still selecting a body part instead of aiming for it. Given that we now have a halfway decent shooter inside Fallout games at the cost of an RPG, perhaps VATS should just become a slow time feature and you have to manually aim instead of selecting limbs. I love that the Fallout games still have power armour but I don't tend to use it all that often in the later entries. You get a more limited view inside power armour and are typically slower. In first person Fallout's power armour is something I save for a special occasion, like a nice bottle of wine or pretty much any expensive consumable item in RPGs. 
In Fallout 1 and 2 the power armor looks great and doesn't make you move slower or inhibit you in any way. Once I've got power armor I wear it all the time until I find something even better. If you want to make combat as easy as possible you obviously need to equip your best weapons, wear your best armor and collect as much ammo as possible to cover every eventuality. Some fights might call for energy weapons, explosives or armor piercing ammo. You can't play on autopilot, you need to keep an eye on the information presented to the player. It's a shame then that Fallout's UI is absolutely terrible. The UI problem isn't only an issue for those micromanaging on the higher difficulties. It affects every part of gameplay on an incredibly basic level. For example, when you're picking up loot, there's no way to see how much space you have left in your inventory. You can't take anything that puts you over the limit, so you have to move stuff around until it lets you take the gear you want. The same thing applies when you're buying gear from vendors. Even worse, you can't see stats for the gear you're picking up or buying. Does that combat shotgun look powerful? Well it's going to cost you 3 grand to find out its damage because it never occurred to anyone to give the stats in the shop screen. A couple of times I even resorted to saving just before talking to a vendor and then reloading the save after buying the item and checking the stats. There was one particularly ridiculous situation near the end of the game that was more the fault of pain in the arse inventory management than UI, but I'm mentioning it anyway because it really bugged me. I was in an enclave base and wanted to upgrade to a better piece of enclave power armour than the one I was wearing. The problem was I couldn't take the second piece of armour from the locker because I didn't have the inventory capacity for it. The easy solution would be to take off my current armour and leave it in the locker to switch it out for the new and shiny piece. Except I'm in the enclave base incognito so the second I take off the armour I get attacked. I had to dump everything I had, or everything that had weight anyway, and then grab the new armour and switch it for the old one in the inventory screen which doesn't alert any guards. I could then take all my gear back. It probably doesn't seem all that egregious by itself but I've been dealing with inventory nonsense for around 30 hours at this point and was just fed up. The UI is part of a bigger problem with player feedback. You do technically get most of the information you need so long as you know who to ask and where to look, but you'd better have a photographic memory. My biggest gripe is the quest log, it's just a list of quests. It doesn't store any information relating to any of the quests, so for example if an NPC tells you that an item you need is available in Urena you sure as hell better remember it because that information will not be added to your quest log. As a one-off thing this isn't too bad, just remember to go to New Reno. However you won't just be dealing with one quest at a time, information is thrown at you in every conversation and you'll need a separate notebook to keep track of it all. This terrible quest log can't be excused as a product of the times either. Baldur's Gate was released a month or so after Fallout 2 and it had a far better quest log that continually updated with each new piece of information. This isn't a complaint about the lack of hand holding. I'm fine with having to uncover the information myself but once I've found that information I'd like it to be recorded somewhere. Otherwise you get the situation where taking a break from the game for a week or so can mean you're completely lost when you get back. It's not just quest specific information you need to keep track of. I went back to New Reno to get a mandatory item near the end of the game. And even though everyone in New Reno was cool with me, the shopkeeper I had to visit was hostile towards me. He attacked on sight and I had no choice but to kill him. Well okay I, I did, I could have gone to another city to get the part but it was late in the game and one dead shopkeeper was a price I was willing to pay. He shot first. The city as a whole liked me so it would have been nice for a record of why this particular shopkeeper had a bit of a grudge. While this section is mainly a long rant, the lack of player feedback actually led to what was without a doubt my favourite moment of this playthrough. The story starts in New Reno as I was beginning my career as a boxer. That's one of the many careers you can embark on in this game. The first few fights were fairly easy. If you keep aiming for your opponent's head then the chances are you'll get a knockout before you run out of health yourself. The third fight is against the subtly named Evan Holyfield and the third one is against the Masticator. That's Masticator by the way. The fight against the Masticator was insane. I couldn't do any damage to him at all and he was quickly whittling down my health. I had no chance. I considered quitting and looking for better boxing gloves elsewhere until the Masticator somehow managed a critical miss and knocked himself out. I have no idea how that happened and I don't particularly care. I won and was crowned a prize fighter. I went on my merry way and completed a few missions in a location called Broken Hills. Yeah. Broken Hills is where you can pick up Marcus, the mutant with a minigun, to be your companion. You have to complete a couple of missions for him before he'll join you. I did all his quests and everything else you can do here. My reputation level in Broken Hills was idolised. It was therefore a bit strange that whenever I asked Marcus to join my crew he would refuse. I'm not coming with you right now. Sorry. My character could only have one companion at a time because she had a charisma of two. I told my current companion Cassidy to leave the squad so this shouldn't have been a problem. I kept trying to talk to Marcus but he fobbed me off as if I wasn't worth talking to despite being idolised in his town. 
I had no idea what to do at this point and I was panicking a little bit. Even though I complained about him earlier, I'm a big fan of Marcus and like having him around. Eventually I gave up and went to recruit Cassidy again, except he was now refusing to come with me too. Now that's really odd, only 5 minutes had passed and I hadn't done anything of note, what could have changed to make Cassidy reject me. After far longer staring at the character screen than I'd care to admit, I finally figured out part of the problem. My charisma had been cut from 2 to 1. With just one charisma point you can't have any companions. It's essentially an even number system, so 2 charisma points gets you 1 companion, 4 gets you 2, 6 gets you 3 and 8 gets you 4. There's no benefit to having charisma of 10 as far as I can tell. The endurance works in a similar way, there's no real benefit to having an odd number of endurance, you should either drop it or lift it by 1 to be an even number. You can get a temporary boost to your special attributes by taking Mentats, so I popped the Mentats and got Marcus to join up with me. That was technically mission accomplished but I had to know how the charisma stat took a permanent drop to 1. That's where I come back to the boxing story. Back when I was fighting the Masticator, a line of text popped up commenting on an injury. I tend to just gloss over that stuff and focus on the numbers. It's usually repetitive things like, that injury will leave an impressive looking scar, and I figured I'd seen all those dialogue lines 100 times by now. I hadn't seen this one. The Masticator bit off my ear. For the young ones in the audience, that's a Mike Tyson reference. So yeah, it turns out that having your ear bitten off reduces your charisma by one. There's no way to re-affix it as far as I can tell, although you can carry it around with you for the rest of the game. Ideally, I'd have liked to clear a notification for something so significant. If your stats are going to take a permanent hit, then you should definitely be told about it. I would never have known for certain that the ear was the cause of the charisma drop if I hadn't been able to confirm it online and then go back to look at the video. The whole situation was utterly bizarre, but I'm not going to forget it in a hurry and that's the best part of Fallout 2. I can't imagine anyone playing Fallout 2 to completion without creating a few memorable stories of their own. That's Fallout 2's biggest strength, although it doesn't really kick in until the second act. The first act feels much like Fallout 1. In Fallout 2 you play as the Chosen One. I have no idea why the developers went with that name. Don't worry, this isn't a typical Chosen One narrative. Your actions aren't dictated by fate and it's possible for everything to go horribly wrong. Maybe the Chosen One thing is a deliberate joke at those kind of stories. It doesn't matter all that much as you can rename your character. Chosen One is likely just a convenient way to refer to your character in spoken dialogue and lore entries. More importantly, the Chosen One is the grandchild of the Vault Dweller from the first game and the child of the Elder who is the leader of Arroyo. Regardless of what you might have done in Fallout 1, there was a canon ending. The Vault Dweller defeated the Master and was then kicked out of Vault 13. The Vault Dweller headed north and eventually helped create the town of Arroyo. A few people from Vault 13 came to join him after hearing about what he accomplished on the surface which just goes to show that banning the Vault Dweller from Vault 13 was bloody stupid in the first place. One day the Vault Dweller disappeared never to return. If Fallout 2 were a modern game this would scream DLC bait but as far as I know we never see or hear from the Vault Dweller again. I'm up for playing that DLC though. An introductory cutscene shows the residents of Vault 13 being given the final all clear to leave the vault. They excitedly watch the door open to reveal the Enclave who promptly tear them to pieces. Not bad for an intro. Instead of looking for a water chip, your goal is to find a Garden of Eden creation kit or GEC. The GEC was an item given to Vault so that the inhabitants of the Vault could create a flourishing new world when they were ready to leave. If you played the first game and read the manual from cover to cover then you might have already heard of the GEC. As I mentioned earlier, Fallout 2 began development a few months before the completion of Fallout 1. The GEC's inclusion in the sequel was confirmed just before the Fallout 1 manual went to print, so the final page of the manual before the appendices is an advert for a GEC. In addition to the base replicator unit that could be used to make food, the kit includes selections from the Library of Congress and encyclopedias. It pretty much reads like an infomercial, so if you call up in the next 10 minutes you probably get a free mop or something. I didn't go with a particularly creative character. I know, I know, you're probably shot to your very core right now. I wanted a character specialised in ranged combat, so perception and agility were important. With that in mind I reduced endurance to 4 because the plan was to not take too much damage. Best laid plans and all that. Likewise I didn't really need strength and initially set this to 3 in my first attempted playthrough but the inventory restrictions became too much to bear. High intelligence opens up more conversation options as well as helping you level up and luck just seemed like a fun random stat to dump points into. I was roleplaying as a bit of a loner character so I set charisma to 2, enough to have one companion at a time. I avoided the temptation to go with the gifted trait this time around because it does feel a bit like cheating. Instead I chose Finesse and Small Frames who help with critical hits and extra agility, although this did mean taking another hit to carry capacity. Skills largely pick themselves for me. 
Small guns is a complete no-brainer because small guns in Fallout is nearly all guns until you get to the later game. I went with speech to give myself options to resolve situations without violence and finally lockpicking because I like free stuff. While Fallout 2 doesn't have an official alignment chart, I was intending to play as chaotic good, which essentially means I do the right thing but don't always follow the rules. In video game terms this means I'm a nice guy but I'll steal from people all the time and don't feel guilty about it because it's for the greater good. Ideally I'd have tagged steal as well but lockpicking was sufficient to start off with. After passing the trials the chosen one ventures out into the wasteland in much the same way as the vault dweller did in the first game. That feeling of familiarity will likely last for at least 5 hours maybe more depending on how meticulous you are about completing early quests. It's simple RPG stuff like rescuing a dog and attacking wild plants. Nothing particularly challenging. You're introduced to Hakunin and told that you can bring crafting ingredients to him for healing supplies that quickly become redundant once you start picking up stim packs. Crafting wasn't a dirty word back in those days. After leaving Arroyo there are three towns that gradually increase in complexity and challenge. You have the freedom to go wherever you want but I suspect most players will go to Klamath first. Klamath is home to Sulik who will likely become your first companion. I didn't form any attachments to my early companions, they were just there to carry stuff for me until I was able to recruit Marcus. Most players will likely get their first gun while in Klamath but not me. There's a gun underground in the rat caves which I fully deserved after fighting loads of the little buggers however I couldn't pick it up. I had space in my inventory and I could see the gun but my character refused to grab it. I'm going to put this one down to a bug because I also couldn't talk to Sulek after killing all the rats for him. You can undertake a few other chores here such as refilling a seal or killing Brahman. We're still in tutorial territory for the most part. After Klamath I headed to the den which is described by one of the NPCs as a hive of scum and villainy. Fallout 2 isn't scared to reference popular culture although in this case it's completely fair. The den is rough. Children will attempt to pickpocket you as you head in and out of bars and there's a local branch of the Slavers Guild. The next stage of Fallout 2's tutorial was learning that sometimes you'll need to take sides in a conflict. In this case you investigate what's being hidden in a church and decide whether or not to help in an attack. Going back to lack of feedback, there's a hidden skill check in here that you likely won't even notice. Unlike later Fallout games, you can't tell if you're failing a skill check because the conversation option just won't show up. This is a touch annoying but not half as annoying as the fight that followed after the skill check. I know I've already moaned about the combat, however it's so bad I have to go back to it. We attacked the church which was being used to hold supplies of one of the local drug lords. One of the NPCs took up a position by the door and an enemy was on the other side. Once in this position I couldn't move into the church. I had no control over the NPC so I had to stand there and try to take aim from outside the church. The rest of the crew I brought with me wouldn't even do that, they just stood around completely clueless. I'd have a lot more to say about the den if so many of its stronger moments weren't done better elsewhere later in the game. The whole cesspit thing is more prevalent in New Reno and the slavery storyline is a huge part of Vault City. The most interesting quest in the den concerns a ghost. Anna can't rest until she is reunited with her locket. If you ask around town you'll eventually find the guy who has it and in classic RPG fashion you can either talk him into giving it to you or kill him. Once you have the locket you return it to Anna's ghost and she vanishes leaving behind a pile of bones. You get XP for this but the quest isn't over. If you find Anna's grave and bury the bones you'll get another huge chunk of XP. I liked the extra little touch at the end but there are two other reasons I enjoyed this quest. First I always find it amusing when Fallout fans get all upset about franchise lore when it turns out they've only played Fallout 3 onwards. I reckon a fair few of them would be shocked at some of the stuff that goes down in the first two games and perhaps they would loosen up a little before going into angry but the lore rants about the mention of things like space travel. Do they have any idea that the second entry in their beloved franchise has loads of unexplained aliens and casual references to ghosts? The answer is no because that would require them to actually play the games instead of just angrily bashing abuse into forums and comment sections. The second reason I like this quest is that it plants the idea of ghosts in your head at just the right time. This could be a coincidence but I like to think it's deliberate. Shortly after the den most players will likely visit a small farm called Modoc. In addition to the usual problems like rodents and poverty there's a missing boy and a ghost farm just to the north. On arriving at the ghost farm you find bodies hung up at the entrance and ghostly apparitions throughout the farm. If your character has high perception it won't take long to realise that both the bodies and the ghosts are fake. However if you did the Anna's Locket quest right before this one as many people will there will be a few seeds of doubt in your head. The ghost farm is run by the Slags, a name which was a source of endless amusement to me as a teenager and another example of why localization can be something worth investing in. You can fight the Slags if you like or just talk to their leader and try to resolve the tension between the Slags and the citizens of Modoc. The missing boy is also down here and you can take him with you once you've earned the trust of the Slags. It's a pretty simple piece of conflict resolution and fairly black and white compared to many of the situations you'll come across later. 
you'd have to be incredibly set on doing an evil run to think that fighting the slags is the sensible option or perhaps just not very observant. At around this time in the game you should trigger an encounter where you see the same people we saw in the cutscene at the beginning, the ones who look a bit like the Brotherhood of Steel. There's a short conversation and then three armoured men brutally slaughter innocent civilians before walking away. One of the armoured men is larger than the rest, that's Frank Horrigan, we'll be seeing a bit more of him later. This scene marks the end of the first act and where the real Fallout 2 experience begins. That first act can feel like a bit of a chore sometimes. The second act is where I lose all sense of time. Instead of playing in stretches of one or two hours, I start playing for about four hours at a time and only stop reluctantly. Fallout 2 sucks me in. Let's start with Vault City and the closely linked town of Gecko. As the name might suggest, Vault City is built on the site of one of the old vaults, Vault 8 to be precise. As Fallout series fans know, the vaults are all part of a grand social experiment by Vault Tech. Vault 8 is the exception to the rule. It was allowed to function as normal, and the inhabitants were allowed back into the world after 10 years, complete with a functional geck that was used to create the surrounding city. If every vault had been treated like Vault 8, then the world of Fallout would be very different today. Vault City doesn't make a good first impression. To get to Vault City you have to travel through a rough area, with people held under armed guard and clearly struggling to get by. The city itself is very different. There are modern buildings, wide open parks and few signs of poverty. As Fallout locations go it's glorious. It's a wonder why anyone would live anywhere else. Well, they don't have much choice. Only citizens of Vault City are allowed to live and work there. Vault City allows non-citizens to live on its border, like the courtyard area you came through to get here, but they aren't even allowed in the walls of the city without a day pass, and even then they are kicked out at 6pm. The day pass is relatively easy to obtain through speech, theft, or completing a mission for Wallace at the customs office. Once inside, you quickly learn that Vault City isn't the paradise it first appears. The citizens of Vault City use non-citizens as what they call servants. If any non-citizen puts a foot wrong, they can expect to pay off their debt through years of hard labour. That natural beauty of Vault City soon looks ugly as you start to think about how the buildings and parks are maintained. People are forced to work for free and lose their freedom. Just don't call it slavery or you'll be in trouble. The city is led by the first citizen, Lynette. She rules with an iron fist, banning drugs, alcohol, gambling, prostitution and pretty much everything else I like to dabble in at the weekends. You'll be searched for drugs before you enter the city walls so be sure to leave the jet behind somewhere if you're carrying. As if you couldn't tell from the armed militia and complete lack of freedom, Lynette is a bit of a tyrant. If you cross her in conversation, she will not hesitate to kick you out of the city and ban you from returning. It won't even necessarily be all that obvious what she's taking offence to. She asks you to deal with a problem in the nearby town of Gecko. If you try to handle things peacefully, Lynette will basically wink wink and nudge nudge until you take the hint that you should just blow the place up. If you don't pick up on her tone of voice, you'll quickly get booted out. Not everyone in Vault City is horrible. The librarian is nice enough giving you some free skill books while lamenting about how everyone now reads books on digital devices which doesn't have the same thrill as reading a physical book. This was written in 1998 when we were still quite away from the Kindle movement. While in Vault City your priority should be to get inside Vault 8 to see if they have another get. However you're not allowed inside the vault unless you're a citizen, the day pass won't suffice here. There is a citizenship test but you'll need insanely high stats to pass it. I believe it's 9 in intelligence, luck and perception. Instead of the test, most players will opt to solve the Gecko problem to get citizenship. Gecko is home to a power plant which is malfunctioning and pumping radioactive materials into the water, which is in turn making the citizens of Vault City sick. Lynette wants you to destroy the power plant, while Harold, the mutant mayor of Gecko, would quite like you to fix it. And yes, this is the same Harold who is in Fallout 1. That tree sticking out of his head seems to be getting bigger, I wonder what will become of it. Lenny the Doctor is also from Fallout 1. He was one of the ghouls in Necropolis who met the Vault Dweller and regrets not joining him on his adventure. Lenny will join up with the Chosen One if you like. My character obviously wasn't about to blow up the power plant, although there are loads of ways you can do this if you're so inclined. Likewise, there are plenty of ways to fix the power plant, the easiest of which is to get someone else to do it for you. This gets you citizenship and access to the Vault so long as you talk to Lynette's understudy and not Lynette herself. You can go one step further and use a computer once inside the vault to optimise the power plant for Gecko. This is a huge decision to make although it doesn't seem like it at the time or even after you've done it. Completion of the quest gets you the usual XP reward and barely any additional conversation with Harold. I wouldn't blame anyone for completing this quest and then forgetting all about it. Optimising the power plant for Gecko is actually the worst thing you can do for them. If you go this route, on completion of the game you'll be told that Vault City took over Gecko to claim the power for themselves. Optimizing Gecko's reactor created a power surplus in Gecko. The Vault City Council, unable to expand because of their limited power supply, yielded to internal pressure 
and was forced to take over Gecko to control the reactor. The peaceful ghouls of Gecko became slaves and spent the rest of their lives serving Vault City. This reminds me a bit of the Junktown quest from Fallout 1. For a quick recap, you had to choose who to back in the battle for control of the town between Gizmo and Darkwater. Making what seemed like the good choice ended up being bad because the town got crushed under regulations and didn't prosper. In my Fallout 1 video I criticised the Junktown quest because there wasn't any way to see the bad ending coming. Ideally a bit of exploration would have revealed clues to the town's fate and allowed you to make an informed decision. Instead it felt like a trick on the player. The Gecko quest is a bit similar although perhaps not quite as bad. Gecko lives under the constant fear of being invaded by Vault City and it's only your intervention in fixing the power plant that stops it happening earlier. It's still a bit of a stretch to predict that improving life for the citizens of Gecko would prompt an invasion, but it's not the same leap of logic required in Fallout 1. I still reckon it's here to be a shock more than anything else though. Fallout 2's most infamous location is almost certainly New Reno. In previous playthroughs I've spent so much of my time here that New Reno essentially is Fallout 2 for me. And yet Fallout 2 offers you so much freedom that in this playthrough I largely ignored it. I wasn't in the mood to settle a dispute between a bunch of mobsters so I didn't bother. There are a lot of quests relating to the major families, Mordino, Salvatore, Bishop and Wright. You can juggle all their quest lines up until the end when you need to make a decision and potentially become a made man. This could easily add another 5 hours of game time. And yet if you're not feeling in the mood to deal with their squabbles you can just ignore them and focus on the many other problems in the wasteland. New Reno is a depressing place. The creation of Jet, which in itself is a side story you can explore in Fallout 2, has led to a huge addiction problem with many citizens living in squalor desperate for their next hit. Not surprisingly the major families of New Reno play a major role in the drug trade in addition to gambling, porn and violence. Personally I think these drug addicts only have themselves to blame. We all know that Jet gives you the ability to see the future. They should be able to make a fortune in casinos. What do you mean that's only a load of nonsense made up by terrible writers who don't have a clue what they're doing? Oh, okay. Perhaps the reason New Reno is so highly regarded by Fallout 2 fans is that this is where the role playing comes into its element. For those of you who are more familiar with Fallout 3 and 4 than Fallout 1 and 2, role playing is this thing where you create your own character with a backstory and act or play a role by doing things that your character would do. Just in New Reno you can become a gigolo, prize fighter, porn star and even a spouse. I've already discussed the weird sequence of events that led me to becoming a prize fighter. I could have also become a made man if I'd wanted, however Gigolo and Pornstar were off the table due to my low charisma. Even before I lost my ear I only had a charisma of two. Charisma is distinct from speech and isn't that important unless you want a lot of companions or a special companion. Back in the day I didn't properly understand the distinction between speech and charisma. I tended to go high in both which is why I used to be a porn star, and I like to imagine a damn good one. When it comes to being a porn star or indeed a Gigolo you need a decent charisma. Fallout 2 essentially links charisma with physical attractiveness. My character was constantly being told she was ugly, so much for escapism eh? Anyway with my distracting ugliness the director of the porn flicks completely refused to hire me for a star role. I would have been game for anything, anything, and yet all I could do was act as a fluffer and I somehow managed to catch an STD just from that. I was a bit annoyed that I couldn't take any opportunity to show off my talents and I'm not convinced being constantly called ugly is necessary but it's these kind of stories that make Fallout 2 excellent. Even my failure was memorable. Likewise I never bothered to romance any of the companions even though I carried a condom around with me for months just in case. Seriously Fallout 2 made me feel like a teenager again. If you're more charismatic than me and my character you might be able to get into a relationship with NPCs such as Mrs Bishop. There aren't all that many to choose from but the option is there. There's even a hidden sex formula. I have YouTube's algorithm to thank for this one because I didn't discover it myself. After watching the Eurogamer video on Fallout's development I got recommended another Eurogamer video discussing the sex formula. I'm not going to go through it in detail here because you can just go and watch Eurogamer's video. Essentially charisma, endurance, agility and strength come into play to determine how happy your significant other is while smoking his or her post coital cigarette. New Reno is where most Fallout 2 stories are made however my favourite area is just to the south with the NCR and the nearby vaults. Back when I first played Fallout 1 and 2 it was quite rare for sequels to be closely integrated with their predecessors at least in the ones I played. The sequels I played back in the 90s were either annual upgrades like sports titles or things like Sonic 2 where developers added a new character and jazzed up the backgrounds a bit. I never expected to pick up a sequel and revisit previous locations. Nowadays most new IPs are planned as trilogies or huge ongoing franchises from the start and when you do revisit existing locations you feel like you're being ripped off with reused content. The reused assets complaint doesn't apply to Fallout 2 for the simple reason that most of the assets here are reused anyway. There's still a limited number of character models and the vaults look similar by design. 
In other words, I was used to recycled assets, but I was not used to getting the opportunity to revisit locations from previous games and see how they had been changed and affected by my actions in another game. Full disclosure, there is no carry forward of save files. Fallout 1 and 2 both had canon endings, because this was a simple time before people acted like pissy little man children about the ending of a trilogy not reflecting all of the hundreds of choices they made over the course of 150 hours of gameplay. It just so happened that many of the decisions I made in Fallout 1 were the same as the canon ending. That's probably an indication of how I always play the safe and predictable route. As you might remember, the NCR was formed out of the group of settlers who previously lived at Shady Sands. In Fallout 1, the Vault Dweller was tasked with rescuing a woman called Tandy. Well, Tandy is now the leader of the NCR, which has built up quite a nice little base for itself. There's a long questline you can complete for Tandy and the NCR, the most important of which being the problem at Vault 15, which you may also remember from Fallout 1, although for some reason the entrance looks a little different this time. Vault 15 is under the control of Darian, who is the sole survivor of the Khan clan who the Vault Dweller killed while rescuing Tandy. Years later he formed the new Khans and is seeking revenge on Tandy and the NCR, having already planted a spy in their midst. Tandy sends you into Vault 15 to get some computer parts she needs. You can steal the part, but ideally you will kill Darian and end the threat of the new Khans. Even after having done that, I wasn't able to complete the quest line with Tandy. I don't think this was a bug. She has a lot of quests she wants you to do, and even though killing Darian is the most significant, it's possible I just needed to complete other chores for her before getting proper credit for this. Either way, it's not entirely clear because of the aforementioned terrible UI. It doesn't matter all that much anyway. I didn't go to Vault 15 for the memories or to kill Darian on behalf of Tandy. My main goal was to hack a computer which would then put Vault 13 on the map. Even if you personally know where Vault 13 is supposed to be located, either by looking up in a guide or having played Fallout 1, your character won't be able to go there until it's officially on the map. This might sound a bit cheap, but remember that despite the tiny view, the map is supposed to represent a sizeable portion of California. It's reasonable that your character wouldn't find a small vault even if she was in the vicinity. You don't have to hack this one particular computer to find Vault 13. You can also track it down by following a bunch of death claws that you might stumble upon in the wasteland, or by examining a painting that you pick up in, I think, Broken Hills. That's technically three options, but let's be honest, the death claw tracks and the painting are easy to miss, and the computer in Vault 15 isn't much more obvious. I don't think it's unreasonable to make some areas hard to find, however, returning to Vault 13 is such a huge highlight that I'd hate to think of how many people miss it. Vault 13 is now full of death claws, and that's actually good news. Death claws are now intelligent after having been experimented on by the Enclave. So long as you don't do anything stupid like start shooting them, they won't be a threat. It's not just death claws either. There's an intelligent scorpion in Broken Hills who will keep beating you at chess unless you help out a talking plant, who will then tell you about a good move that will help you beat the scorpion. Fallout 2 is brilliant. Death claws and humans live together peacefully in Vault 13, however, they have a problem they'd like you to solve. The voice recognition program in the Vault 13 computer needs replacing. This is relatively easy to find and, to be honest, it's a bit of a basic fetch quest. The easiest way to get hold of it is to buy it, but you can find the necessary part in Vault City as well. Completing the quest for Gunther, the head Deathclaw, gets you a Gek that they just happen to have lying around. Remember the Gek? That's the reason you set out on your quest in the first place. You can, of course, head straight back to Arroyo to let them know the good news, but most of them won't be there. The Enclave invaded and captured the Elder along with other important members of the tribe for reasons we'll find out soon. You should have known it wasn't going to be that easy. Going after the Enclave is the final act of the story, and it's a touch disappointing. The Enclave has a base out in the Pacific Ocean, and conveniently there's a large tanker in San Francisco. Less conveniently, the tanker doesn't work. You need to fuel it and gain access to the navigation computer, which in turn requires you to get a fob to open a door. This is where things start feeling a bit restrictive. The fob is only in Navarro, as far as I know, so you have to go all the way to a heavily guarded Enclave base to get into one specific room, which in turn has the fob. Clearly the developers wanted the player to go to Navarro to meet the Enclave, but there has to be better motivation than a locked door that needs a special key. The Brotherhood of Steel have a base in San Francisco, and they also encourage you to visit Navarro. The Brotherhood want the plans to the Enclave's Helibird transport to build their own version, or at least figure out how to deal with the Enclave if they attack the Brotherhood. The Fallout 2 version of the Brotherhood is probably my favourite depiction of the group in the series. They're feeling a little down in the dumps now they're no longer the most powerful military force in the wasteland. They're vulnerable and reacted in the way that many vulnerable groups do. They shut themselves off to outsiders, becoming a closed and insular group desperate to hold on to past glories. San Francisco has a lot to offer, including another choose the faction quest between the Shur and the Hibologists. I could go into a detailed description of the Hibologists, but it's much easier to say that the group is basically a joke version of Scientology. That tells you about all you need to know. The Hibologists also want the Vertibird plans because they think it will help them get to space. The Shur are ancestors of the crew of a Chinese submarine. 
They are led by the Emperor, although if you get an audience with this Emperor it turns out to be a computer. Still, the Emperor is useful as you can use it to divert fuel to the tanker. The Shur are technologically advanced enough that other factions want a piece of the action, but they are determined to keep to themselves, which is likely why you haven't heard of them much outside of Fallout 2. There's a brief reference to them in Fallout 4 because Kellogg used to work for them. Regardless of who you work for, you'll soon head north to Navarro to get the fob and probably the Vertibird plans as well. This is where Fallout 2 goes downhill slightly in my estimation. This final act railroads you into completing the final missions in a fixed way more than any other part of the story. Instead of having a variety of choices in how you complete a mission, you have a variety of different reasons that you might do the same mission, but limited ways to complete it. This is also when it becomes nearly impossible to avoid combat. You can technically get the fob from Navarro without entering into combat, but that doesn't mean much when getting to Navarro in the first place means encountering a lot of Enclave soldiers who will tear you to shreds if you aren't already in power armour. These are the fights I mentioned earlier in the video. I couldn't even run from these fights without dying, let alone actually compete. Having more companions might have helped, but I'd have lost at least one person per fight. You can reduce the number of these random encounters by travelling via car. I've never actually had the car in Fallout 2. You need 2,000 caps in a particular part to get the highwayman running. The 2,000 caps is a lot at the start, but you'll be able to afford it later on. The issue is more that I forget to pick up the part. The quest is a touch convoluted. You have to talk to Skeeter in another town to get the part, but he will only trade it for another part, and to get that part you have to complete a quest for Valerie in Vault City. This isn't impossible by any stretch, but you might remember me complaining about the lack of updates in the quest log. This is one of the problems. When I'm deep in six different quests and still exploring a new world, I can't always remember how all the separate quest lines are linked together. I've tried to think of ways to get the fob without having power armor, and I think you would need a character with ridiculously high specs in Outdoorsman to avoid all these fights, combined with a very high sneak and lockpick to get the fob from Navarro without fighting. Unless you happen to have spec'd your character specifically for this goal from the start, you'll probably want the power armor for the run to Navarro. So how do you get the power armor? Well, you can get the Vertibird plans with the Brotherhood, which means going to Navarro, so you can probably see the problem with that. You can also buy power armor, although it costs an extortionate amount. There's also power armor in the military base, which you can break into by adding dynamite to a car and blowing it open. So you do have options on how you get the power armor, but most people will still need it and they will need to fight once they have it. The most annoying part of the Enclave attacks is that there's no reason for them to attack you at this point in the story. The Enclave at the base don't attack you on sight, so why do the random squads you bump into shoot you on sight? The video game reason for this is that the Enclave attacks are here to stop players running straight to Navarro at the beginning of the game. That's not a great story reason though, and I'm sure it could have been avoided. What about the option to earn the trust of an Enclave soldier somewhere elsewhere in the wasteland and have him put in a good word for you with his buddies? This quest could be located near San Francisco to ensure players fully explore the map before getting to Navarro. Once in Navarro, the Vertibird plans can be grabbed by passing a speech skill check, so that was no problem for my character. The FOB on the other hand wasn't so easy. You're initially presented with a pacifist option. The FOB is in the commander's office. If you approach the office, you can pretend to be the cleaner or come back a bit later and do it after the guard has conveniently hinted that they need a cleaner. A cool little touch is that if you are a low intelligence character here, the guard will automatically assume you're the cleaner and let you in. Either way, getting into the office isn't too difficult. The harder part is stealing the fob from the locker while the commander is standing right next to you. My lockpick skill was more than sufficient, but no matter how many times I tried, and I tried a lot with some aggressive saves coming here, I couldn't get that fob without entering combat against the entire base. Eventually that's what I had to do. I fought this entire floor of Enclave soldiers and then legged it never to return. I believe you can pick the lock while sneaking if you have a high enough sneak skill, but that wasn't an option for me. It's again disappointing there didn't appear to be any way to get the fob by talking to the commander or creating a distraction elsewhere to lure him out of his office. Maybe you can do that. I had a quick look at guides and it does appear that the commander leaves his office occasionally, however if this is something you can deliberately trigger then I don't know how. Before getting myself barred from the Enclave Club, I helped a Deathclaw escape and picked up a new companion. A man called Dr. Schreiber was performing experiments on one of the intelligent Deathclaws. If you want to release the Deathclaw, all you need to do is grab the keycard from the Doctor's desk. You're conveniently told that this room is completely soundproof, so if you don't approve of the Doctor's work, then feel free to kill him and free the Deathclaw. Once the Doctor is out of the way, you can recruit his robot dog K9, although you have to fix it first. Having a robot dog as my only companion felt like a perfect way to end this largely solo venture. Even if you leave Navarro without having angered the Enclave, you still have to fight Enclave soldiers who attack you on sight even if you are now wearing Enclave armour. It's pretty silly. Once you've got the necessary items for the tanker, you can fire it up and storm the Enclave base that's out in the ocean. I always enjoyed this cutscene back in the day, and I still do, however the whole situation is a little odd. 
You don't use the tanker to attack the Enclave with a large force, you show up by yourself and with whatever companions you happen to have with you. It's not exactly a stealth approach either because, you know, you arrived via a massive bloody tanker. It won't be immediately obvious at first, but you won't get far on the Enclave base with your companions, even if your companion is a robot dog that was created by the Enclave. You'll be attacked on site unless you enter alone. I've seen rumours that you can enter with companions if they happen to all be in power armour of their own, but I've never been able to confirm this. The need for power armour suggests you're here incognito, but as I mentioned you arrive by a tanker, not exactly subtle. Besides, the Enclave already know who you are. They know a lot about you in fact, so it seems really odd they would attack you on site. Even the actual President of the United States is happy to talk your ear off and let you have the run of the place. From a story perspective I don't get why you can't bring in companions, I guess the game just wants you to be alone here. And yes, you did hear me correctly, the President is here. Given the state of the world in Fallout, I can't imagine there was a free and fair vote to elect him President, but hey, that's American elections for you, am I right? You can avoid the President if you like, but he has a crucial keycard that can turn the tide of the final battle, and he also provides a lengthy info dump that you won't want to miss. This is where, after two games and probably at least 50 hours, we find out what Fallout fans in 2018 already know and take for granted. The vaults were designed in part as social experiments. Some vaults didn't have enough food synthesizers, some only had men, and some were designed to open after just six months. It's Vault 13 that's the most interesting. It was supposed to remain closed for 200 years to be a control group. As we know this didn't happen because the water chip failed, forcing the vault dweller to leave the vault and eventually form a royal. According to President Richardson this all worked out for the best. There were still citizens left in Vault 13 to be the control group, untainted by radiation from the surface, and you saw the Enclave go in and grab them at the start of the game. President Richardson then does his best James Bond villain impression as he reveals the details of his dastardly plan. The Enclave wants to cleanse mutants from the globe as it believes this is the only way to ensure the survival of humanity and democracy. Just in case you're tempted to agree with the Enclave, you should bear in mind that you yourself are considered a mutant. You grew up in Arroyo and while you still look human for the most part you're considered impure. Plus many mutants are intelligent and live peacefully alongside humans so you know, don't be an arsehole. The Enclave found the FEV virus after the death of the Master in Fallout 1 and its scientists adapted it to kill mutants instead of turning them into intelligent superhumans. Apparently the virus can be released in the air and the jet stream will carry it all over the world. Strangely it seems this virus will also kill humans unless they're inoculated. The Enclave plans to do that soon, but how? Are they only going to inoculate humans that are part of the Enclave? I didn't quite follow the logic in this bit. It doesn't really matter because this information is only here as a hint that not all Enclave members are currently inoculated, so if you want you can convince a scientist to release the virus in the base and kill most people here. It's a nice touch. They start complaining about feeling ill and eventually die in often dramatic circumstances. While you're with the President you'd be well advised to kill him because he has an incredibly important keycard. We'll see how important it is soon. Frustratingly you can't steal the keycard from him because choice is gradually being taken away from us at this point. You can at least kill him silently with super stim packs. I have to admit this is something I picked up from online conversations about Fallout 2 over the years, I never knew you could do this back in the day. Super stim packs heal a lot but they also deduct some health points after a couple of minutes. Not a lot so you may not notice when you use them yourself. It would have been nice if the game had communicated this to you a little more clearly but I've already discussed Fallout 2's issues with feedback. If you pump him full of super stim packs he will start taking damage a few minutes later and eventually die. Killing him this way buys you a little more time to wander around the base without being shot at. You find the Elder being kept prisoner and there's also a Gek here. Fallout 2 forces you to pick up the Gek before it lets you proceed to the end of the story. This is presumably so that Arroyo can get its happy ending, however I would have preferred the option to leave the Gek behind and let Arroyo suffer. That needn't be a canon ending but it should be a possibility. The rest of the story ends in this rather forced and unsatisfying way. You have to blow up the base which means finding some dynamite if you don't already have it and then dropping it down the reactor. On your way out you meet up with Frank Horrigan, a huge super mutant and specially modified power armour who works for the Enclave, despite their goal of wiping out all mutant life. We haven't seen Horrigan since he killed those innocent people at the end of the first act, so you'd be forgiven for having a bit of a who the hell are you moment here. This is where you should have the chance to talk Horrigan out of killing you. He's not all that bright so perhaps you could trick him into letting you leave or have him kill himself like the master. You have to fight him and he's bloody tough. You can recruit a few soldiers to help you out but even so it's going to be a rough battle. Your best option by far is to use the nearby computer to turn the turrets against Horrigan. Remember you'll need the presidential access keycard which you can only get from killing the president. I really dislike the way you're effectively railroaded into killing the president, taking his keycard, taking the Gek and then fighting Horrigan specifically in Enclave armour while using the turrets to fight alongside you. 
I should emphasize that yes, you can do this bike by yourself and there are some cheesy moves you can use to give yourself an advantage such as standing in certain positions. However, most people will do the same thing because trying to fight Horrigan is insanely hard even if your character is well suited for combat. This is far different to the situation with the Master when it's clear you can talk your way out of the situation in a couple of different ways. You can even side with the Master if you like. With Horrigan you can only fight him. After defeating Horrigan you leave via your stealth tanker and watch as the base explodes. A lengthy slideshow makes you feel proud or guilty about your accomplishments or lack thereof. I still love these slides and I don't know why Bethesda stopped using them. They're a cheap but effective way to have players feel like they've accomplished something with their decisions. Despite being a touch critical of the lack of choice at the end, I should be clear that you are constantly making choices in what you do and how you do it. I've often described the way I accomplish something, but you might do it in a completely different way. It would be exhaustive and tedious to list every possible choice you can make, plus to be honest I don't know all the choices. I'd have to consult a wiki and if you want that level of detail you might as well just go to the wiki yourself. It probably sounds like I've gone through Fallout 2 in great detail and that it's now not worth playing. I can assure you that's not the case. I deliberately left out a fair few towns and locations, such as Reading, which is the subject of a turf war between three other factions, and there are huge quest lines that I've barely touched on. If you like, you can uncover the creation of the infamous drug jet, or as it's now called after Fallout 4, plot device. The ending is perhaps a touch disappointing, but if you like the sound of the middle section where you make a character your own, then there's a lot to enjoy. In my Fallout 1 video I concluded by saying I didn't recommend people play it today unless they're a huge franchise fan or are interested in gaming history. There was a little too much holding that one back, whereas I was sure Fallout 2 was a lot better. Some people in the comments disagreed, can you imagine, and thought Fallout 1 was the better game. I still disagree, but I understand now. Fallout 1 is a shorter experience with fewer opportunities to make a life of your own in the wasteland, but it does offer more choice in key story moments. Fallout 2 let me live in the wasteland and fail to sustain a career in porn. However, it didn't let me talk my way out of fights and far too often railroaded me into a fixed path. Worst of all, it made me invest skill points in outdoorsmen just to reduce random encounters. That's almost unforgivable. The good moments outweigh the bad for me. You can easily play through Fallout 2 without noticing you're being railroaded in a certain direction because it's likely the route most people would take anyway. I suspect this is something that shows up more on multiple playthroughs. If you are considering playing Fallout 2, my one piece of advice would be to save often and in different save slots. Fallout 2 is buggy. The performance issues are relatively infrequent, but when they pop up, they can be game breaking. Given that Fallout 2 is 20 years old, there doesn't seem much point in going through them in detail. It's not like they'll be fixed. One of the more amusing bugs happened in San Francisco during a fighting tournament. You're tasked with killing other fighters, which seems completely unnecessary by the way, and I knocked one of them out. He was still alive, but the fight was declared over and we went on to the next one without a break. The guy who was knocked out then got back up while I was fighting someone else, so suddenly it was two against one. I also had a bug where I couldn't leave the ring after a fight. San Francisco in general also has a habit of slowing down quite a lot and you have to restart the game to get it back to normal. I also had issues not being able to start a couple of quests, which was especially annoying in one case because I was about three quarters through a quest line and reloading didn't help. These are all well known problems. Fallout 2 is fondly remembered for its humour. Some of it is a little cringy, such as Dr. Long Wong, which is presumably supposed to be a play on Long Wang, and there's the many, many nods to popular culture. There's more pop culture references in Fallout 2 than a box set of the Big Bang Theory. In addition to K9 from Doctor Who, there's also the Bridge Keeper from Monty Python and the Holy Grail and loads more. The Bridge Keeper explodes if you answer all his questions correctly and his robes are some of the best armour in the game up until you collect power armour. You should also expect a few fourth wall breaking moments such as a collection of Fallout 1 characters reminiscing over their experiences in the old casino. At the beginning of the video I mentioned that the people working on Fallout 2 were split into teams so that each could focus on a different location or a couple of different ones. I doubt I would ever have noticed this without being told it, but once I knew I could see evidence of it everywhere. There are plenty of quests that require you to travel to other locations to get items, but there's never anything particularly special about the location or the reason you need to get there. You can almost imagine the developer's notes for the quest in Vault 13 where you need to find the voice recognition module. They probably left the possible locations blank and waited for someone else to fill it in. Near the end of development, a member of another team then decided that well, Eldridge and New Reno would sell the part and uh, a spare will be in Vault City. There's no particular reason why Eldridge would have the part, he just does. I felt this way for nearly every fetch quest, there was rarely any logical reason for items you need being where they were. It also looks like the different groups of developers were thinking along similar lines when it came to story ideas for the various towns. As you might have noticed, slavery is a big part of three different locations, the Den, Vault City and the NCR. This could be trying to impart a particular message about the wasteland in general, but it felt like three different towns just happened to have slaves. 
There are even two different quest lines that have you participating in rounds of hand-to-hand -hand combat in a ring. The only major differences are that in one of them you wear gloves and fight to knock out instead of death. I'm sure this was all a necessary sacrifice for Fallout 2 to be developed in around 18 months, and it doesn't bother me all that much. Perhaps I've been desensitised to pointless fetch quests over the years. Having to go to another city just to buy a part from a random shopkeeper is pretty much par for the course these days. The final thing I want to emphasise is not to worry if you don't enjoy Fallout 2 or if it doesn't appeal to you. Even if you're a huge Fallout fan, it's fine to not like Fallout 2 or not want to play it. You'll likely see a lot of talk online and maybe in the comments section here about how games like Fallout 2 are from a time before excessive handholding became the norm, where games weren't afraid to make players think while they walked uphill to school both ways, etc. I'll let you in on a little secret. That's largely nonsense. I've noticed a trend where people like to think their ability to play technical games like older RPGs is somehow indicative of their intelligence and people who can't play these games are somehow stupid. First of all, I really dislike the idea that people's worth is tied to their intelligence. Second, the cleverest people I know are terrible at games. I know people who live and breathe spreadsheets but won't be able to play games like EVE Online that are essentially glorified spreadsheets. If you're good at certain games, be they old school RPGs or forex strategy titles, what that means is that you are good at those games. It doesn't make you a better person, it doesn't make you more intelligent, and it doesn't make your humble bragging on the internet any less unbearable for normal people. I'm only halfway competent at Fallout 2 because I used to play it as a teenager. I would likely be terrible at the RPGs based on D&D. You might be the opposite, or you might not be particularly good at any of them. Maybe you just don't enjoy the turn-based nature of Fallout's combat. That doesn't mean you don't like to think or that you need developers to handhold you through games. If you do, so what? Perhaps you value your time. I find this weird elitism in gaming incredibly frustrating as I suspect it puts people off trying games outside their comfort zone for fear of ridicule. And God forbid you don't happen to understand all the mechanics right away. If Fallout 2 looks interesting to you, then give it a shot. You can often pick it up cheap in sales. If you don't like it, don't play it. You can still be a gamer and yes, even a Fallout fan. Don't let the vocal angry people put you off trying Fallout 2 or stop you pulling it down if you don't like it. This series on isometric CRPGs puts me in a bit of a weird position when it comes to the Fallout series. The next entry that I'm prepared to talk about is Fallout 3 and that's obviously not an isometric CRPG. I didn't have any plans to do videos on Fallout 3, New Vegas or Fallout 4, however I must admit I am now tempted. In particular, playing Fallout 2 again has made me rethink my attitude towards Fallout 3 slightly. One of the most obviously bad parts of Fallout 3 is its main story and yet the same could possibly be said for Fallout 2, especially near the end. I'm not letting Fallout 2's ending overshadow what I enjoyed about the game before that, however I think I've let Fallout 3's ending influence my opinion on the game as a whole. Well, the ending and the stupid moral choice about the bomb. Don't get me wrong, endings are important, but I might have got carried away. You only need to look at the nonsense around the supposed worst game ever made, Mass Effect 3, to see that people's anger over endings can get a touch out of control. Plus, Fallout 3 can look pretty nice if you install all the mods. I don't know, I'll add it to the list. Maybe I'll stream the playthrough. I apologise for taking so long to get this video out. As usual, this is where I make more promises that I probably won't keep. The next video should be an in-depth critique of Metro Last Light, and after that, probably a Baldur's Gate 1 retrospective. I'm not sure what to do about Siege of Dragonspear. I'll probably play that and discuss it as part of the Baldur's Gate video, but I'm honestly not decided yet. I want to play it before Baldur's Gate 2, however that also means playing outside the order of release. Feel free to make suggestions in the comments. As for other videos, it's possible I'll slip in a couple of shorter reviews if the opportunity arises or if I just fancy talking about a game for some reason. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see the future content. I usually ask people to hit the notification icon at the same time as subscribing to ensure you get notified of my videos, and I still want you to do that but I'm going to include a bit of a caveat this time. You know those annoying 20 second videos that people sometimes post to let you know they're streaming live on a completely different service, and how it's a pain when they show up in your feed or notifications even though that's not the content you subscribe for and want to be notified about? Well, yeah I'm going to do them occasionally, sorry. I enjoy streaming a lot but I have to admit it's so much more fun when there's a lot of people in chat. Here's the compromise, I will only do these videos at the start of a new set of streams. So for example, I'll be streaming Detroit Become Human on release and will stream in roughly 4 hour chunks until I'm done with the game. I'll release a short video to let you know that the first Detroit stream is about to start and then no more until I start a new game. I'll also delete the videos after the stream so it won't clog up sub boxes. Hopefully if you're just a normal subscriber that won't be too much of an inconvenience. It's probably not even going to be one notification a week. If you have the notifications turned on, then I hope you'll forgive the intrusion. Actually, I hope you'll come along and watch, but you know what I mean. My stream plans include all sorts of stuff. I need to play Kingdom Hearts games and Darksiders 2, plus I like to throw in random stuff like House Flipper, which was strangely engaging for a few hours. I'm also tempted to embarrass myself by playing Kerbal Space Program, but my self-esteem is fragile enough as it is. Speaking of self-esteem, please follow me on Twitter and check out my website where I post reviews for games I don't do videos on. Okay, that's all for today. Cheers.